I'm with Marcus Powell, who is RMIT University's entrepreneur in residence, and Marcus teaches business, marketing, planning, and strategy. Marcus has had an extensive career consulting with industry, community, and service organizations throughout Australia, New Zealand, and into the Asia Pacific region. Marcus, let's start with a really obvious question. What does being an entrepreneur actually mean? An entrepreneur simply is someone who can recognize an opportunity, turn that opportunity into reality, and deliver. That's it. Inside an organization, outside an organization, for profit, not for profit, the local soccer club, the local anything. That's people I find fascinating. And when I say that to them, oh, I'm an entrepreneur. Yes. Oh, I thought it was really complicated and you were a born person and only certain people could do that. What I find interesting with an entrepreneur is that all children are entrepreneurs. They've got mastery in negotiation, in sales, wonderful imagination. They're curious. And then they grow up. We educate them. And here's the paradox. Then they go and pay a lot of money for courses of how to remember what it was like to be a child to have all those wonderfully powerful skills again. An entrepreneur, someone that does something. So are there things that people can do on their own, people who don't have the opportunity to go to your talks and workshops, for example? But what can people do to unilaterally to re-engage that spirit? It's really interesting too that when, say for example, Joseph, I rang you at work and I'd say, how are you? And you'd say to me, I would bet, you'd say to me, I'm busy. We've talked ourselves into busy. And by being busy, we get so focused on action, 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 very, very spontaneous. The first piece of advice I would give to people watching this would be stop. And you go, what do you mean stop? Stop doing for a while, start thinking. Just stop. Physically, stop. And I've tried this with managing directors in corporations around our region. And one of them related this story to me. Marcus, two weeks later after I said this, stop. I don't, know, I don't like your advice, mate, he said to me, laughing. He said, this is what happened. I went back to my office and I pushed back my chair behind my desk, put my hands behind my head, closed my eyes and just stopped, started to think about our organisational strategy. He said, it took about three minutes. My executive assistant, it's a glass office, came in and said, are you OK? Would you please go away, he said. I'm thinking. She didn't know what to do because he's a man of action, yep. meeting, meeting. About five minutes after that, a director came in and said, what are you doing? Shouldn't you be doing something? And I'm just visualising our next steps for success and growth. I need the time out. Oh, we have an annual conference for that. Out of the habit of constantly reviewing where we are. And the final story said, which we were roaring in laughter, said, I had a senior, I think it was part of the board, came in and he exclaimed, for heaven's sakes, do something. What does that say to you about being busy as opposed to thinking about what we're going to do next? The other thing about you can help by doing is, would you have the courage to not have as many meetings? And I find meetings are an interesting thing, particularly with technology. We're sharing so much information at the speed of light. Why do we have to talk about what we've just emailed? And I tease my colleagues terribly, you may say. I say, what well, are you lonely? Do you need to keep meeting people? The next, and the final tip would be is to resist the temptation to dismiss. Because all ideas are valuable, and but all ideas are vapour. They're nothing until they turn into opportunity. Most of us are trained to say, no, it won't work. The entrepreneurs say, hmm, possible. Let's do something else. That would be my three immediate suggestions to consider. I would, I would love to be a fly on the wall watching people watching this, having their eyes closed at work. Even funnier to me would be if they have a timesheet, what are they going to put down for those five minutes? Would there be a special code? <laughs> An IO code for mindfulness. <laughs> a, mind, a mindfulness code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like or a stillness it. code. Yeah. yeah. What's the difference between being entrepreneurial and creative? Uh, I know some people, for example, who kind of bristle at the idea of business and they're not really into that kind of thing and they find the word entrepreneur has all sorts of baggage with it. So it, it, can we think about entrepreneurialism outside of business? I would hope so. 
the interesting thing to me is that quite often people will put the word entrepreneur into this negative area that it's a bit like that example about failed entrepreneur successful business person entrepreneurs also make good press when something goes wrong one of the most i suppose interesting things about entrepreneurship to me is if you're in the arts in literature in music film uh, not for profit is that when those students and alumni come to see me about just through curiosity what is this thing called entrepreneurship i've heard all the the hysteria about it. What is it for me? Last year, for example, there was a photographer, fantastic she is, and she does pet photography. I thought, mm, great idea. And she was very cautious about selling out for her art, which is a common thing. I'm not sure where this comes from because I say, Pursue your art, deliver an artistic dividend, but why not enjoy an economic dividend as well? Can you do both? Do you have to choose? And she looked at me and said, I don't have to choose, can't I do both? So she entered the business planning competition and came third, which is a wonderful result. Her measure of success was going from full time down to her pursuing her passion about taking beautiful pictures of animals. And after October of last year, five or six months, she thought she might be working four days a week. She's down to one day a week, other job, four days a week pursuing her passion. What a wonderful success. I tell that to people that do uh, sculpture, jewelry, music, poetry. I was a foundation member of the Australian Poetry Board. And when the poet saw me arrive in a dark suit I thought either I was from the Australian Taxation Department mm. or something had gone wrong or I was from the Council of the Arts. I said, why can't we produce literature and create a dividend? The results of Australian poetry have been spectacular in terms of achieving both. Really, it comes down to the words. It's about also the actions about what an entrepreneur does. Do as I do. It seems to me that one of the key aspects to success in all entrepreneurial endeavours is the ability to be able to add value to people's experiences. I wonder if you could tease out some of the different ways that people perceive value and how we can go about fulfilling those needs. One of the, the popular myths around entrepreneurship and value, it's always money. Mm. And to me, the money is important. And there's this little thing that I do when we get to finish workshops or we, we do um, a session together or I ask everyone to close their eyes and they get a bit suspicious and then I reassure them it's okay, I'm a consultant, trust me. Well, they even get really worried. And I say, say after me. And they go, oh, happiness is, and they say happiness is, a positive cash flow. And they go, what? And what do you mean? I said, you must make more than you spend. It's a fairly old fashioned idea. Is that what entrepreneurs do? We must make more than we spend. But that to me is economic value. What I find drives most people is the intangible value. The sense of achievement, their sense of accomplishment, the sense of making a difference to someone's lives, someone uh, affecting positively into a community, whether it be creation of employment, reduction of crime, social entrepreneurship in other words. To tease it out even further, I've been very lucky to, to work with the Maori community and it's taken 11, 12 years for me to be accepted into one of the tribes in the North Island. And I teach Maori teachers how to teach entrepreneurship in Maori, which is when you get your head around it, it's okay. And I was talking to the, the leaders of this particular tribe and they were very suspicious. One, I was Australian. Two, white guy. Three, old white guy Australian. And you're over here? What the hell are you talking about? Anyway. I said, how do I, I said, I'm thinking, how do I demonstrate this? Because you, you're speaking in the round, they're sitting around you and you're in the middle. And I'm trying to convince them that at least entertain the idea of entrepreneurial education, which is, which is old, it's been proven, it produces results time after time after time. The evidence is there. We've passed the, the wonderment of entrepreneurship education. And I said, okay, 
if you stand on one leg, and I'm standing up, you stand on one leg, it's unstable, and you would think the entrepreneur only stands on the leg of economic success, which could be often translated to greed. Oh, let's think GFC. What happened if, if we only focus on money? You fall off. Your community focuses on community dividend. It's all about helping each other with no view of making more than you spend. You stand on this leg and it's unstable. Why don't you stand strong on both legs? And they go, got it. But what got me was they said, we no longer have to choose. Pertinent to the volatile global economy in which we currently live, we often hear the phrase, in chaos lies opportunity. Very, I have to agree. Very dramatic phrase. Is it true? I have to agree. Yeah. And this is, it comes back to, I suppose some people think it's a bit corny about this, this blinker idea that as times get tougher, we tend to focus in like this all the time, more and more detail. How can you possibly see opportunity? Because things are banging off each other. I'll give you a couple of examples about how this works, but if I can reinforce the idea, just take them off a little, be brave, be comfortable, and just observe what's going on. To me, Einstein said uh, creativity to him was making connections others can't see. That I can see something in Spain and something in South America, and if I put them together, bang, there's an opportunity. But if you're so focused all on you, and here we are sitting in Melbourne today, like this, all I can see is Melbourne. Get them off. I have a friend who's an entrepreneur, surprisingly, and he has seven businesses, as you do, mm. lucky seven, and he goes on holidays every five weeks. And people watching this will go, what? How can you do that? Oh, he only employs people that can make him money, and he looks after them. That's his business model. He thought, hmm, he loves skiing. I think I'll buy some ski lodges, as you do. How did he know to go to the best ski place in, in America, buy them, and make a profit in financial chaos? Because he's so connected around the world. He travels constantly, all the time. We talk about in entrepreneurship these antennas, if you will, these little antennas. And there's the two forms of entrepreneurs in chaos. When we travel around, and because we we understand what each other is trying to achieve. I'll be, I'll, I know what you want out in the marketplace, for example, Joseph. And when I'm meeting my people, someone will say, I want this, and I go, you need that. So what we do is we connect people all the time, which comes back to the thing about how do we deal with chaos, is that the networks that we, we model for young people that come through the university system is what can you contribute to the network as opposed to what can you take because the givers always get rewarded. And some might call that karma, some may call that good manners. That's the oldest technique in the world, by the way, the old club system, what can you give? The other myth around entrepreneurship, and I'll come back to chaos again, it's about greed and it's about self-interest and it's about ripping people off. It's not sustainable, particularly in this country. It's a tiny place, you do that once, it's all over because of the networks protect each other. The chaos in this country has been less compared to, but my experience is predominantly Asia, very lucky to work through Asia, New Zealand up through Asia, consider Australia to be an integral part of that region. I look at my friends in those countries and they say, look at the opportunities. That's all they say, look at the opportunities. You see businesses downsizing, you see people being made redundant, all these sorts of things. Many reasons for that which we won't touch today. But what is the opportunity? We've talked quite a bit here about the opportunities of entrepreneurialism and the kind of things that you can do as an individual when you, you know, you're taking the initiative. Sure. But what are some of the challenges that the individual faces in trying to be entrepreneurial within an organisation that might not have that spirit at its heart? Yes. I run a, a programme for groups of CEOs and the, the title is, after all the cutting, what have you got left? You've done quality, you've cut it to the bone, what have you got left? And I say, entrepreneurship. Most of these people are running companies between, say, 50 to $100 million turnover, lots of staff. And then they go, oh. I said, do you remember when you either started or grew the company successfully? Or have you forgotten how to do that? Because you've been so consumed with trimming, adjusting, which is good management, but is that leadership? Then they go, 
oh, you're right. And then I say, think of this. When you get to work or you log on remotely, would you like in your inbox opportunities to choose from or problems to solve? And they go, but all we do is solve problems. I said, well, when do you do deals? When do you have fun? When do you go and chase the opportunity? Oh, we're too busy. So I said, why don't we push that down, that entrepreneurial spirit, down the structure or across the structure, it doesn't really matter. So therefore, we train everyone to remember what it was like to be a child, to look at opportunities and present them to you to choose from. But I'm the... I said, so you've got so much spare time to do it all, have you? Intrapreneurship, a clumsy word, that is basically an entrepreneur inside an organisation. Sometimes they're called project managers, sometimes they're called change agents. But to me, and this is where I did my research in, is measuring large changes, because innovation means change, and that's what scares a lot of people as well, is that measuring systems that will actually empower and train everyone in the organisation to filter and screen ideas to the leadership to say yes or no. And can you imagine with these techniques and tools, which is, they're, they're not difficult, they're just practised, is that if your company and my company were competing in the same industry, you had the training, you could probably process 50 ideas a week to get a yes-no decision. I would take probably three weeks for one idea. Would you have the unfair advantage? I think you would. Inside an organisation, and why is it so difficult to be an entrepreneur in a large organisation? I've been one in many large organisations as an employee, as a contractor, is because you frighten people. And there are so many ways to crush innovation like that. The easiest way is to say no because I'm frightened of making a decision. And any change program, any innovation program will fail immediately if the CEO is not present at the start of the program, at the middle of the program, and the completion of the program. And now when I consult around the region and help large organisations do this, I say, which is a consultant, which is hard to say, I won't do the job. <gasps> You're thinking of the cash flow, the excitement, the fun of making a difference, unless the chief is not there at the start, the middle and the end. There are about six or seven requirements for change to stick. We can be busy, we can be motivated. There are some organisations, I'll go away and do an innovation program, then they can say, I've done innovation. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. You have to embrace it and you have to do it. And it's been successful and there's been spectacular failures because either those things have been present, successful, or they've failed. And I've been lucky enough to do that in education, in professional services, in government, in five countries with different political, cultural, religious, spiritual frameworks, and it repeats beautifully. So is it is it something special? No, it's just a lot of common sense, you might say, in hindsight. But the thing about it is inside organisations, there are some clear things that you must do. There are clear things that you must avoid. Another thing, for example, middle management are measured from the top and they're measured from the bottom. You ask them to participate in a change program, they're caught because not only their own jobs, but they've got another measurement on them now as well. So I've tried innovation programs from the top down, from the bottom up and from the side. I've been lucky enough to try them all. Which ones work? Only if they're top down. You used a phrase, um, minimum effort for maximum result, mm. which sounds almost too good to be true. Mm. So I, mm. I want to know, how exactly do we go about yes, I've got a box in, of enacting I these, this extraordinary thing? The, 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 the reason I use that is because it, it's me having a dig at people being busy. And I try to snap people out of busy all the time. Not, not, I know there's workloads, but how do you snap people out of busy? I had this preposterous job once where I would walk with CEOs on the beach. and Someone's they, got to do it. Well, you know, the, the, the funny thing about it was is there, there were American CEOs out here for two or three year posting on their jump into Asia. A lot of American officers do that. And I, I would do, I did this for about a year and a half and they'd ring up and say, 
they talk to me about, they'd articulate their strategy and I'll be the sounding board. But because I lived virtually on a beach in Melbourne, I'd say, well, how would you like to go for a walk? Just to, just, no phone, just go for a walk. And you'd see them tense up. I said, all right. And, did it. and the, the joke was after a while, I'd like to see you for one kilometre. I'd like to see you for five kilometres. I said, five kilometres, this is serious. So but people would ring me and, hello, Marcus, what are you doing? And I was going, nothing, which throws everyone, as you know, when you say that. I said, listen to this. And I put the phone down and hear the wave. Where are you? I said, I'm in consultation. I'll have to ring you back. And the point I tell these stories and do these things is because if you're busy, you normally get tired, physically tired. If you're physically tired in a tough environment, you become emotionally exhausted. The research shows that if you're emotionally exhausted, creativity cannot occur. Oh, I work best under a deadline. No, you don't. You work best under adrenaline. Closes off. I discovered this about minimum effort for maximum results when I was fortunate enough to work with Edward de Bono when he decided to set up a centre for thinking in Melbourne several years ago. And I was his director for innovation and enterprise down there um, with the CEO he appointed. And what I found interesting is working with him and learning all these techniques, which I use occasionally because I was under this idea that we were so busy we couldn't come up with ideas. The problem was we had so many ideas, we don't know what to do with them. So, then we go into innovation, which is the implementation of ideas. The smart thing about it is it gives you so much time back, it's the minimum effort. Because as I said about processing ideas, you did 50, I did one. Minimum effort, maximum results. And it's not about being, um, I suppose, more people or more resources. It's about how well you use this thing up here. And that's what I mean by minimum effort. It's not at all being lazy. It's a nice idea, what are you lying on a beach sipping a cocktail? No, no, you still have to work hard, but it's the effort to achieve the result. Marcus, I think that's a great place to finish. I'm going to go and strategically do nothing for an extended period of time. Oh, good. And so when I ring you, you'll, you'll answer, Marcus, I'm doing nothing. Absolutely. Good luck. Thank you very much. <laughs>